Hello, I'm Mike Wagner, and uh, the purpose of this talk is to introduce you to the Clue protocol, uh, for which, if you're not familiar, is like the internist equivalent of the FAST exam. It uses a foresight protocol to look at the heart and lungs, give you a lot of useful information in a short amount of time. So even if you're clueless with regards to ultrasound, um, hopefully by the end of this talk, um, you won't be clueless with regards to the Clue protocol. So. Getting started with a case, you have a 62-year-old male comes into your clinic with a chief complaint of uh, feeling terrible and dyspnea, who has a history that sounds like a COPD exacerbation. He has a history of COPD, um, but he has some concerning family history for cardiovascular disease and uh, venothromboembolic disease, uh, as well as having a lot of cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and uh, when you look at him on physical exam, uh, there's nothing that's uh, terribly pointing you one way or the other as far as uh, cardiac versus pulmonary could be both. Um, and when you uh, formulate your differential diagnosis after doing your physical exam, you, know, you could be leaning either way. Um, and, and certainly some of these things on your differential are, are quite concerning, um, potentially even life-threatening. Um, um, and uh, you want more information. So how can we get more information at the bedside? Well, uh, we can do EKGs if you're lucky enough to have advanced biomarkers or lab testing at your outpatient facility. That's uh, sometimes helpful. Uh, usually you can get chest radiography, but that again is also dependent. Uh, and uh, echocardiography is, is really rare to see in an outpatient setting unless you're closely tied to a, a cardiology service. So uh, in this case, let's say your EKG shows sinus tachycardia and some non-specific T wave changes, uh, but no arrhythmia, no ST segment elevation. And let's say your chest x-ray shows uh, some bolus changes and flattened diaphragms with uh, some borderline cardiomegaly, but no pneumothorax or uh, infiltrate. So you decide to treat him sort of empirically for CPD exacerbation in the office, give him a couple nebulizers, see how he's doing, and uh, him being the kind of guy that he is, he just kind of wants to go home with inhalers, but there's something about him that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up a little bit. And so the, our key question is, can ultrasound increase our diagnostic abilities uh, at the bedside? And so the CLUE protocol was really designed to do just that. It was designed by a cardiologist at Scripps Clinic. Uh, and the CLUE stands for Cardiopulmonary uh, Limited Ultrasound Exam. So we're going to look at the heart, we're going to look at the lungs, um, we're going to look at the IVC, sort of tie all those things together and see if we can increase our diagnostic abilities. And we'll go through that um, step by step here. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to put your um, uh, cardiac probe up in the um, left sternal border with a probe indicator in the cardiac settings pointing to the patient's uh, right shoulder. And so what that does is that um, cuts the heart along its long axis from base to apex uh, and this gives you a, a nice sort of bullet shaped left ventricle uh, when you're imagining yourself sort of looking um, from the patient's left hand side towards their right and you're seeing sort of the heart uh, up at the top and the anterior portion all the way down to the posterior portion. This is down towards the apex. This is up towards the base. Okay? And so um, the different structures that you need to be familiar with in a parasternal long axis view. Um, there are a couple. Uh, we're just going to go through a couple basic ones for the purposes of clue protocol. We'll go over other ones in different uh, screencasts. So uh, the most anterior structure of the heart is going to be the right ventricle. The next thing you're going to hit is the interventricular septum followed by the left ventricle. Um, flapping away here in the middle of the screen is going to be your mitral valve. This is the anterior leaflet. This is the posterior leaflet. This here is going to be the left atrium. This is going to be your aortic root coming out and this is going to be your aortic valve. And so right away that's a normal pumping heart here. Um, you can tell um, even if you don't have any echocardiography uh, experiences that uh, this is a normal heart and uh, this is obviously a very sick heart here. And we're going to pay attention to only two things um, with regards to these echocardiograms, okay? 
we're going to look for evidence of left ventricular systolic dysfunction. And our surrogate marker for that is just going to be focusing purely on the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So we're going to look to see whether or not it approaches the septum during diastole. And the key number to remember would be one centimeter. A lot of times you can just eyeball it and see whether or not the septum appears to sort of or the uh, mitral valve appears to slap up against the septum. Um, when the systolic function is impaired, a lot of times that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve doesn't even come close to the septum. There's, this is not perfect. Uh, an E-point septal separation, as it's called, uh, it has a lot of limitations uh, to include aortic insufficiency, mitral stenosis, uh, regional wall motion abnormalities, or severe LVH. Uh, but this is, I think, a, a good place to start for beginners. If the mitral valve appears to slap up against the septum, it suggests a very normal EF, okay? So the second question we're going to ask ourselves is, is there any evidence of left atrial enlargement? And the eyeball or rule of thumb we're going to use is, is, is the left atrial AP diameter the same as the aortic root AP diameter? Are they about the equal? And in a normal patient, they should be. When there's left atrial enlargement, the AP diameter here will be um, much bigger than the aortic root. And so if we see left atrial enlargement, um, that's going to be a sign that the left ventricular filling pressures are increased. Okay? Think of the left atrium as the hemoglobin A1C of left ventricular filling pressures. Over a long period of time, it's going to cause the left atrium to dilate and stretch when the filling pressures are elevated. Here's an example of just a dilated cardiomyopathy, and you can see the mitral valve is not coming anywhere near that interventricular septum. Left atrium is very enlarged here. Here you might be inclined to say that the function is normal here because they're beating quickly. Um, but you, if you pay attention closely, you can see that this is definitely not coming within one centimeter here, and this left atrial AP diameter is quite large. So next, we're going to move the probe from the heart to look at the lungs. Now, when you're looking at the lungs, it's important to realize that lung isn't going to look like lung. Your lung's going to have a very much a, an artifact pattern to it. So you have to realize you're, you're just interpreting lung artifacts. But there is some stuff we can kind of make sense of. And if this is all um, Greek to you, just um, go back and, and take a look at the intro to lung ultrasound on the uh, Sono Internus website. So, um, but essentially here's a rib with shadow, rib with shadow, uh, and this white line here is the pleural line, the interface between um, the lung and the chest wall, and all this up here is chest wall, and all this down here is artifact. And when you put the probe uh, on um, the anterior surface of the lung, um, and you put it in between the intercostal space to look at the lung parenchyma, um, this is a normal artifact pattern that you get, this reverberation artifact where you get these horizontal lines coming down from the um, uh, visceral parietal pleura is suggestive of aerated lung. Now, just because it's aerated doesn't mean it's normal. You can get this pattern in asthma or COPD or um, even pneumothorax. Um, but what we're looking for is to determine whether or not the lung is aerated or uh, wet. And so this is an example of wet lung. Here you see rib with shadow, rib with shadow. You see the lung sliding back and forth here. And then you see these vertical artifact patterns we call B lines. And we're going to look, we're going to say that that's abnormal. When you see multiple B lines, meaning more than three, in one intercostal space, that's going to be suggestive of wet lung. And we're looking for bilateral evidence of B lines, or which suggests pulmonary edema. Okay, so just for rehashing, A lines, horizontal artifact pattern, reverberations of the pleural line all the way down, um, versus um, a B lines where it's a vertical artifact pattern um, coming down in um, a one intercostal space. Um, and so what are B lines? B lines, um, conceptually, you should just kind of think of them like curly B lines on a chest x-ray. Think of them as um, thickened uh, interlobular um, septae um, in the lungs. Um, whether or not it's filled with scar or uh, water, um, we can talk about at a different time. But it's, think of B lines as like curly B lines, the ultrasound equivalent of um, seeing crackles, if you will, or um, 
um, seeing B lines on a, a chest x-ray. So after we look at the lung parenchyma and get an idea of what the pressure is like in the capillary system, whether or not that's causing pulmonary uh, edema, we're also going to look at the costophrenic angles to look for evidences of pleural effusions and see whether or not there's chronic high pressure uh, in the pulmonary capillary system causing pleural effusions. And so imagine your um, probe like a flashlight beam as always um, and at the costophrenic angle um, it's coming from lateral to medial. Okay, And so um, this is with the probe marker pointing down in the cardiac setting uh, correlating with this probe or screen indicator on this side this is down towards the feet and then this side would be up towards the head. Okay, So up here and then um, this would be closer to the probe over here and then this would be lateral to or um, deep to the probe from here so medial so this is going through the liver on the right hand side and then you're hitting the um, vertebral bodies as they move midline here um, that's these white lines here and then in between the lateral and medial you see this bright white line that's going to be the diaphragm. Now in normal air rated lung uh, you get this mirror image artifact where it looks like there's liver on the other side of the diaphragm. You can see how the tissue kind of seems like there's like that on both sides whereas when you have a pleural effusion you get this black fluid above the diaphragm here. Um, very clearly you can see the lung outlined by this black fluid which is something you won't see when the lung is aerated. So here you have an example of the uh, curtain sign where aerated lung is obscuring um, everything sort of behind it. Um, when the lung is um, surrounded by pleural fluid, you don't get that curtain sign um, because the, lung, or the um, ultrasound beam is actually able to travel through pleural effusion quite nicely, show you what's on the other side. Okay, This is an example of a um, curtain sign in terms of the mirror image artifact that we said was suggestive of normal aerated lung where it looks like there's liver extending past the anatomic boundary of the spine and also uh, when the diaphragm comes down it seems like it sort of conceals or covers up the spine and then reveals it when the diaphragm goes back up. So this is a normal which means no effusion. Whereas when you can see the spine above the diaphragm that means the ultrasound beams are able to go through the liver, go through the pleural effusion and show you what's on the other side and that's uh, that's a that's a positive spine sign suggestive of an infusion and it can be very obvious and it can also be subtle so finally we're going to move to the subcostal region to take a look at the inferior vena cava in the right atrium um, now a lot of people have put um, a lot of stock into looking at the inferior vena cava and assessing volume status and central venous pressures. Um, I personally don't like that um, in of itself, but I think it, it, it's, it gives you a lot of information when used in conjunction with the heart and the lungs. Okay, So what we're going to be looking for is, is in general the size of the inferior vena cava as it courses um, through the liver into the right atrium. Um, when it's um, relatively small and collapsible, it suggests the, um, their uh, uh, have a normal volume status and low central venous pressures whereas when it is large and uh, non-collapsible um, as you can see here um, without changes during respiration that suggests a high CVP or elevated volumes. Again I don't put too much stock in that unless I have uh, information with the heart and the lungs. Um, so uh, the numbers to keep in mind is, is a very, very large IVC is uh, 2.5 centimeters or greater um, and you're looking for a, at least a 50% collapse in um, spontaneously breathing folks. Um, again, very controversial, but I clinically have found it to be very useful. Make sure you don't confuse the IVC for the aorta. So tying it all together, you can get an idea of uh, left ventricular filling pressures and impaired systolic function. Um, whether or not this is a chronic thing, whether it's a systolic or diastolic, you'll get left atrial enlargement. B lines allow you to distinguish between somebody who has pulmonary edema and uh, a COPD exacerbation along with um, um, pleural effusions. And then you can tie that in with what's going on in the right side of the heart. 
um, which is nice. So in our patient, he has clear evidence of left ventricular systolic dysfunction and left atrial enlargement. He has a bilateral pleural effusions and pulmonary edema and enlarged IVC, which is suggestive of uh, new heart failure with impaired systolic function. So we can see how that would change management in our patient. So the clue is easy to learn. The physiology makes sense, and it provides useful information even for the novice. But most importantly, it provides a framework to build a more comprehensive heart-lung ultrasound exam. So use these additional references to your advantage. Uh, I certainly have. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks.